Thanks everyone for joining the second in our series of the IMAP Invasive 3.0 training. Uh, we, of course, recently launched the newest version of IMAP Invasive and it's a complete, you know, from scratch redesign. So to make everything a lot easier to use and hopefully have more uses of it than we ever had before. So we're very excited about it. Uh, on Monday this week, we did a webinar called The Basics. And for that, we had people log in and enter some simple data. If you were not able to attend that webinar, we do have that recorded and you can find it on our website. Um, and you can, um, we will be jumping into some of the more advanced stuff so you can follow along. All right, and so I'm just gonna in introduce everyone to who's here in the room with me at DEC. First of all, I'm Jennifer Dean. I'm with the New York National Heritage Program. And we manage, we manage the um, IMAP Invasive database for the state. And with us here, we have Brittany Rogers, who is with the Certified Trainers Network. I'm sure many of you have interacted with her if you're a certified trainer. Uh, we have Colleen Lutz, who helps us with a million different things with the IMAP program, and you've probably also emailed her. And we also have Gabby, who is our summer in intern, and she's an ESF student, and hopefully we'll get to interact with some of you throughout the summer. Great, and so as we go along, Colleen and Brittany will be monitoring the chat box. So if you have any kind of technical issues or if you get stuck on something, there is a little chat bubble um, on the WebEx interface on your webinar, and you can either chat to everyone or you can chat to Colleen Lutz or Brittany Rogers individually so that um, they'll be able to help you. So if you have issues logging in or things like that, you'll be able to communicate with them, and hopefully they can get everything figured out so that you can continue going. All right, and so as most of you know, we, we use that IMAP Invasive system here in New York to track invasive species and track management data. So, you know, if people are going out there and doing control work, uh, we, you know, we document that and then also, you know, follow up that you might have as well. This is used by state agencies, conservation and agriculture organizations, and the general public to both enter data and share that information. And so in April, that's when our newest uh, version of IMAP Invasives, the 3.0, launched. And when we, when we did that launch in April, um, and what you'll see today is our initial launch. We wanted to get something out in time for the field season, so we focused on data entry and some basic map viewing functionalities. Um, there will be more coming. And so we'll be able to, um, to see more of that um, throughout the summer. We'll be Let's see, getting into the email alerts and the queries. Um, so stay tuned to, um, you know, the accounts that, the email account that you have tied to IMAP as those, uh, we'll announce those as they come out. All right. And as you saw from the course description, everyone has some homework. Um, we were wanting you to be able to log in and enter a presence record. So hopefully you were able to successfully do that if you did run into any problems, please let us know. Um, you can chat with Colleen or Brittany now, or you can contact us after the webinar. And I'll have our um, contact information up on the a slide here in just a moment. And so, you know, with that first webinar, as I mentioned, we entered some simple data. So we entered a presence record and a not detected record. And today we're going to launch into some of the more advanced data types. Um, and so we're going to start with some terminology, um, starting with the basics. So what you learned earlier this week is the presence record. If you were uh, familiar with IMAP2 terminology or, you know, all the terminology we used up to this, this is equivalent to our observations and assessments from, I, from IMAP all along over the years. So you saw an invasive species at a sort, certain point in time at this location. Um, some of the key differences now with the new interface is now a presence record can be um, a, po a polygon, a point, or a line, which is great. Um, you can actually enter multiple species at one presence um, location. So, you know, as we all know, there are many places in New York, unfortunately, that you can stand in one spot and list off, you know, five to ten different invasive species without even moving. Um, so for that presence record, you can record multiple species. 
Um, and it also has a lot more detailed data fields than the previous observation did. Um, you know, there's those fields that, such as abundance and distribution and things like that um, that are part of the presence record as opposed to being a separate entity, which in IMAP2 is called the assessment record. So everything's together in one record type, which is great, makes things a lot more simple. Um, we also have now a not detected record type. So what didn't you find? You went out specifically with a search image in mind for a species or a group of species, and you searched that area but did not find it. So this record type is absence data. It's super valuable as well, um, you know, to especially as people get into more modeling of distributions, that absence data is really important. Um, there are search, or different data fields relevant to your search effort, like the time spent searching. And then, of course, treatment record. And this is probably the one that's most similar to what we had in IMAP2. You know, you, you can delineate the area that you treated something with a polygon and then add a lot of details about what you treated and how you treated it. All right, so I'm kind of working backwards, as you'll see here in a second, that each of these different record types are each connected to a base area of a, a new record type that we call searched area. And so the searched area is kind of the all-encompassing um, record that will house um, presence not detected in treatments um, that are occurring at that same location at that same point in time. So this becomes very handy when you're going out and doing a lot of work at a certain site for that day. Um, if you're going out and just making a lot of um, presence records and you don't necessarily need that detailed information recorded, um, as you enter presence records, even with the mobile app, that searched area record is being, being created in the back end, but you never really have to um, know about it or see it because it's just automatically created. It's when you start getting into these more complex workflows that that searched area really comes in handy because it, it ties everything together. All right. And so what I want to do now that we have kind of a, a concept of the different data terminologies that we have, I'm going to go ahead and jump into the, the system and see how this all applies. And so we're going to go ahead and log in. So just a reminder, if you have yet to log in to IMAP3 since it has launched, um, you need to follow the directions in the help documents that are on our website. Um, if you had a previous account, you're going to use the forgot password. Um, if you have never had an account, you're going to use the sign up. But I'm assuming that everyone has already gone through that stage, and I will go ahead and log in. Oh, if I can get my, <laughs> there we go. All right, so as we get into these more advanced data types, the first thing that I want to have everyone check is um, their accounts information. And so with IMAP Invasive 3, um, you need to be tied to some type of organization, even if it's a generic organization, to be able to enter treatment records. And so to check your affiliation, you want to go to the icon in the upper left-hand corner that has the menu bar, and you want to go down to your account. So go ahead and click on your account if you're in there. And make sure that if you are affiliated with an organization, that you have a, a primary organization listed there. Um, and so this is where we're, we're going to try out our tech support uh, skills here. If, you, if your um, organization is not listed, you can go ahead and chat to Colleen or Brittany um, what organization you would like to have listed there, and they will go ahead and add that now, and then you should be up and running um, within a minute or two after that. Um, so we're, what we'll do is um, hopefully if you were in IMAP2 previously, then your organization affiliation has transferred over. Um, if it hasn't, then um, let us know. Or if you are a volunteer and you don't have an organization that you're working for for invasive species work, or if you just you know, your work is as a volunteer, then let us know that as well, and we can add um, what I mentioned is a generic organization that we have, which is called no organization affiliation, um, but that at least gives you access to the treatment data entry. 
All right, great. So I'm going to carry on. Um, let's see here. So we checked our organization. If you are missing your organization, you chat it with Brittany and Colleen. And we're going to go back to the map. So I clicked on the icon again. I, I selected the map. And as you notice from, you know, difference from IMAP 2 is that IMAP 3, really everything starts from the map, which is great. You know, it is a spatial database that really emphasizes the information that we have. Um, just as a reminder from our first webinar, there are some navigation tools, map navigation tools on the left-hand side. You know, you can zoom in, zoom out. Um, you can uh, go to where, you know, you really want to use this when you're ready to enter data to go to where you want to enter that information. So I'm going to go ahead and push this little, the crosshairs button to um, allow it to go to my location. Um, you could also use the search bar to type in an address. So here we're at the DEC building and 625 Broadway. Um, so I'll enter that there. All right. And so say I, I'm going to go ahead and look for the spot where I want to enter my treatment records or my, my records in general. Um, here I'm going across the, the Hudson River here. I'm going to use the table of contents. I've clicked on change base maps so I can see my satellite imagery. And we're going to use this, um, this area of land that's on my screen there to enter our data. And so what we're going to do here is use this Create Record tool. So I'm going to click on Create Record. Um, as you see, and as a reminder, it, you're going to see the, the single presence, single treatment, and single not detected. Um, as a reminder, in the first webinar, we talked about single presence and the single not detected. Um, so you can enter those, of course, as points, polygons, or lines. Um, you can also enter those two record types from the mobile app, which we also talked about. The single treatment allows you to enter a treatment record um, quickly if there's already a presence record for that species at that spot. And so um, that's one thing to keep in mind if you already know, say, there's a spot here in the middle of the the river and say I know that that's water chestnut, I am entering my treatment on top of it, I can do that. But let's say that I'm going out fresh and I'm entering all this data from scratch. So what I'm going to use is this multi-record search area tool. And this, um, with that new data concept that we have of the search area underlying all data types, you know, we now really have that ability to tie together all the work that's done at that one site at one time. And that's what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to say I spent all day at this, this site here doing a lot of work. And I'm going to walk you through this. And the demo that I do right now is, you know, it's, I'm going to go through each of the, um, the steps of it. Um, so it's, it's going to take a extra time, more time than what you would typically do when you're sitting down to enter a record. Um, that's so I can show you that there's, you know, lots of options within there, but there's also lots of places that you can skip um, and places where you can pause if you want to add more data. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. So when I click on that create record and the multi tool, the multi um, searched area record tool, um, the first thing it asks you is to draw your searched area. And so I want to um, add a polygon to the area where I did my work today that I'm going to be adding more information about. So as you click on the map, you can actually even hold down your mouse and free draw if you want to. Um, and then you double click to close that polygon. So this is the area where um, I was searching, I was looking for the species, I was um, doing treatments and so forth. Uh, you also have other options to do either a buffered line or a point for your searched area, but I went ahead and did a polygon there. So I'm going to hit next. On this, so I define my search area first, and now I have the opportunity to add presence records. So I hiked, you know, up and down this area multiple times, and I found some, let's say I found some mile a minute there. So I'm going to add a presence record within that polygon. So the first thing I'm going to do is say I found one sprig of, of mile a minute, 
um, I could, I can add it as a point, a line, a polygon, or I can apply it to that whole searched area if I want to. I'm going to just place this as a point. So I found, you know, an individual plant right here in the bottom component of that. I'm going to hit next. It'll ask for my species that I saw. I saw mile a minute. And then, you know, I auto-populate as the observer, and the date, of course, auto-populates. I can tag projects to all the records of what I see there. So I'm going to go ahead and put down my, my test project that I have. Um, and then I can, you know, of course, fill in the presence details if I choose to um, about that, that finding that I had. So, you know, of course, we always encourage people to add photos. Um, let's see if I have... Here, this is going to be my test record that I will, I will delete, and I will show you how to delete. So I'm going to put in our adorable invasive koala into there as my mile a minute um, spokesperson. Let's say I found one plant there. Um, I'm not going to do a percent cover, but I will do um, a, a more qualitative distribution. I can hit the edit advanced details if I want to put more information about there, about like the impact, if there's if I was doing a biocontrol project or if this was an intentional planting. So there's lots of information I can put there. And I hit next. And so I've recorded that one presence now. Um, and now at this point, I can either move on to the next screen to go on to treatment or I can add another presence. So let's say I, you know, I found that one plant, but I was suspect that there's going to be more in that area. So I had searched even more and I found a large clump. So I'm going to go ahead and add a polygon to my search area. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. And say I found, you know, a big patch of mile a minute up here in this upper corner. And I'm not very good at drawing polygons, so I accidentally went outside the, the original polygon shape and it, it clipped it to, um, for me so that it fits within that search area. Um, you can see the little note that pops up that my polygon was clipped, you know, to fit inside that search area. If I you know, had accidentally made that searched area polygon too small to begin with, then I can hit this hyperlink and go back to edit that searched area. But I'm going to go ahead and hit next. So once again, so this is an, another presence, so I'm going to hit mile a minute. And let's say while I was, you know, investigating this clump, I also saw a lot of garlic mustard interspersed throughout there. So I have two species now that are associated with this spatial location of that red polygon. So once again, I can tag it to my project if I want. Um, for each of those two species now, I can add those details. I can add photos. Um, I can put in the distribution and so forth. If I keep scrolling down, I can see the garlic mustard. And once again, I can add those details. Um, one thing to note with some browsers, and sometimes I think with Macs as well, um, you don't always see that there's a scroll bar right here. It just kind of depends on how it's viewing. You know, just make sure that you get on this interface and scroll down to make sure that you see whether or not there's more down there. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and hit next. And I now have my two presence records um, recorded there within my search area. And luckily, those were all the invasive species I saw, so I'm going to go ahead and continue on. And the next thing it'll ask me for are my um, whether or not I did any treatments. If I did not do any treatments at this point, I could just hit next. But I, I'm going to go ahead and pause here and um, record a treatment because I'm going to go ahead and this little spot population of mile a minute is easy enough to pull out quickly. So I'm going to treat that mile a minute that's in there and hit next. I'm going to um, draw a polygon around the area where I treated. So I'll zoom in a little bit. And, you know, make my treatment polygon around that mile a minute. And I can hit next as well. So it's actually, it's, sh it's showing me um, in this gray text here that there, it says zero previous records and one current record that, that match that species, essentially. So it's, it's confirming that, yes, you do have a, a species under there. If this was an older species record that I was drawing the treatment polygon under it, then it would say one previous record and one or zero current. All right, so I hit next, and this is where my treatment details can begin. So it, you know, of course, populates to today's date as the begin date. If you want to 
put an end date, you can if it's longer than one day. Um, there are some additional questions like whether this was a follow-up treatment or initial treatment. And there are other fields you can fill in as well, treatment goals, comments, rare species precautions, and so forth. Um, you can add photos if you'd like to of the, the treatment itself. So lots of details that you can get into and, um, and document. Uh, and then we get into what type of treatment you did, whether it's a physical, chemical, or biological treatment. Um, we're following those concepts of, of IPM, the integrated pest management, um, with these different breakdowns. So let's say I did a, I pulled it out. So I'm going to pick physical. Um, this, so this was a manual removal for the treatment methods. And then um, since I did pick man mechanical, then it's going to ask me, you know, exactly what mechanical um, method I used. If I would have, you know, I can actually add additional ones if I wanted to. Say if I also put a barrier down, then it would also pop up the barrier methods questions. So there's lots of details that you can put in there for lots of different treatment types. If I would have selected chemical, it would ask me details about that chemical treatment that I could document. All right. So I have that one treatment in there. I could add more treatments if I, say, if I did treat that higher or that other area as well, I could add that. But I'm going to go ahead and hit next to leave the treatment options and now go into those not detected details. So you can see we're kind of following the order of that create record button where it goes from presence to treatment to not detected. So while I was working in this area, there were a few hemlock trees and I went ahead and I, I checked those hemlocks while I was wandering around and luckily found no hemlock woolly adelgid. So I'm going to document that it was not detected in my site. And let's say, you know, in that course of wandering, so let's say I spent 20 minutes um, searching the hemlock trees specifically. So this is my not detected record. Once again, I could tag it to a project. I can add photos. So, you know, here I might want to add a photo of the hemlock tree just so that I know that I, I knew which species I was looking at, that kind of thing. Um, we talked about this in the first webinar, that reason for not detecting. Perhaps this is, um, oops. Once again, the, sometimes the scrolling can be a little difficult. Here we go. The species has never been detected here previously. Any additional comments? All right, so I hit next on that. I finished up my not detected record. And now I'm at the point where I have a summary for this whole site record that I just did. Um, I entered a searched area, right? So I can um, actually hit that little eyeball here. And it highlights in blue my searched area location. And I can also edit any of these records at this time if I wanted to. Um, for my presence records, I can hit the eyeball for that and it'll zoom into my koala bear um, mile a minute. <laughs> and if I scroll on down, I can look at my second presence record and hit that eyeball and it'll highlight that polygon that I, um, where I entered both the garlic mustard and mile a minute. And if I scroll on down further, I can, um, view that treatment record that I answered. So it's a good way to kind of, um, oh, before I finish, sorry, that last one is the not detected record. And so since the not detected record is part of, you know, it's also part of that searched area, the um, not detected component applies to the whole searched area itself. All right. So it's very handy to be able to go back and, um, you know, review these different data types that you just entered. Um, you review them. I'm going to go ahead and hit complete. All right. So now it has um, created each of these records. I can um, turn on the legend to see what these different data, data types are. Um, let's see here. If I click on the, the table of contents, I can see the legend, but I can also look at the individual layers themselves. So um, I have the presence species layer, which is actually the confirmed um, presence, presences that we have, um, the unconfirmed records, so I can turn those off and on, um, the not detected species, so of course remember the not detected one was for that whole searched area polygon. And you can also change the transparency of these, which is handy if you want to highlight certain ones on the map. And then our treatment record. So 
So our treatment record was that little um, triangle that's there in the bottom, and you can turn that off and on as well. And if I keep scrolling down, then I have the, um, the searched area. So it gives you a lot of flexibility on how you want to visualize it on the map. So if I, um, you know, if I just wanted to look at, say, the treatment and the, um, the, um, the, the observation or that presence record, then I could do that. Before. Great. And so now what I want to do, I'm going to go ahead and turn that search area back on. I'm going to go to um, my summary box where it says your record has been saved, and it shows me the record numbers of each of those records I just created. So I did, I created, let's see, six records um, with, and just one with using that one record creation tool. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the searched area so that you can see how that appears. So, oops, sorry, I'm scrolling a little too fast. I'll increase my screen a little bit. Um, so you can see the, you know, the details of what's going on as I hover over the different polygons within that map. They'll highlight down below where you have this um, kind of this record indicating like what information you have there. I'm going to scroll up a little bit if you, um, Let's see, if I can, um, I have these, the edit and the delete tools up at the top. So if I hit edit on my record, then I can see the, um, the details that are editable. I can add more comments here. There's actually more details for the searched area record um, where it says edit details before it said see more. Um, so if I scroll down, there's actually additional questions in here that were not presented in the um, Create Record tool um, just because it would get too large and unwieldy if we put all the different data fields in there at once. So if you do have some really detailed um, data types that you want to collect information on, then you know, please explore the, the searched area record in the edit mode because that will expose all these other fields that could be there, like the number of um, the crew hours, so like how long somebody's been working on it, so man hours and woman hours. Um, if it's water body, like water body type, um, different host species that you might be looking at. So just a lot of really detailed information that you, you might need. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and cancel that. Um, so I can show you there's a list now of all these different records that we created. Of course, we created two different presence records, one of them with two species and one of them with just one species. And I can eyeball them on the map or I can use the little arrow link to go directly to that record. And so now I'm looking at that presence record where I had two different species. I can edit this one as well. Um, so I hit that edit tool then I can hit edit record and there's a lot of information that I can fill in right here for this record. And of course you can also, here I'm going to cancel that, you can also go back to that searched area page. So everything is linked back and forth, which is great. You can bounce back and forth between these different layers of records. And you know, I, for this level of complexity, I don't see many of our um, you know, citizen scientists who are just interested in um, recording the presence records, really getting into this detail and needing to bounce back and forth between the records. But if you are out there doing a lot of work at your site and, you know, if you are recording these multiple presences and treatments and not detected together into that searched area record, then it becomes really handy. All right, so another great thing that I love personally about IMAP3 is that everybody now has a delete function. <laughs> you don't, if you accidentally created something or was testing something, you can delete your own record because as a reminder, this is the live database. Um, so if you were testing things right now, those things just went into the live system. So um, you can go ahead and delete your record. It's going to ask you why you're deleting it. It's a test record and it's saying, do you want to delete this record and all the records underneath, meaning, you know, all those associated presence and treatments and so forth. So I'm going to say yes. And um, you can see there's a little restore button just in case I didn't really mean to delete it. Um, but it's gone now, so it's great. So I can go back to the map and it should go back to that location we were at. Oh, or maybe not. 
right back to that location. <laughs> Here we go. Um, we'll make sure that those were deleted properly. So if I go back to the river, I'm going to go scroll back up to our site where we were at. We had our satellite imagery on. Yes, there's our same site. So luckily all those records are gone now. Um, they've been deleted properly, which is fabulous. All right, so a few other things that I want to show you. I know we talked about the, um, the basic navigation on the map as we were um, during that first webinar, but it, there are some other exciting features on the map that I didn't go into, so I'll go into here. Um, first thing one th that we did, you know, of course, we did look at on the, um, on the first webinar is using this filtered records. Um, tool, and so you can say filter for your species or multiple species. I'm going to need to back back out so I can actually see Hemlock woolly adelgid. Let's see here. And so, as you've probably noticed if you've played around on the map, once you get to a certain zoom point, the, the points are all um, creating or turning into these um, hexagons or circles. So it's a way to display that data, you know, at a larger scale so that it's still, the map still loads quickly. Um, otherwise, if we kept everything as points, as we backed out, you know, to that network level, when we get to, like, into the millions of data points, it would probably crash your browser <laughs> if it was trying to, end, to, um, to show each of those individual data points. So, you know, as you zoom out, you, you see those um, distributions, you know, showing up instead of the data points. You can change your base layers, of course, like we did before. So back, you can go back to that topographic base layer. Um, let's see here. The, um, and, just, and when you're at this point, the, um, the present species toggle is what toggles off and on those hexes. Here, I can increase the transparency so you can see that a little bit better. And this present species at this point is considering both confirmed and unconfirmed data. And so you have to zoom in, of course, to get back to that point level to be able to distinguish between the confirmed and the unconfirmed. All right. And so I'm going to, oh, another thing I can show you are underneath these um, geographic map layers. This is where you can get different boundaries, like say the state boundaries, um, the county boundaries, let's see, that's spinning for a moment, let's get the, the county boundaries on. Um, we have, if you scroll on down, there's something called the Regional Management Partnership. Here, I'll turn off the counties. These are our prisms. Um, and so, the, um, we, they're not labeled as prisms because this is a, a nationwide, actually, uh, continental-wide database now. And so um, not everyone calls prisms prisms. You know, they have different names like CWMAs and things like that. Um, so by calling them a more um, general term, it made it more applicable to the whole network. All right, and you can see like Pennsylvania has some of these regional management partnerships as well. Um, so it's great. There's, um, you can see see these layers across state lines. And we have something called hydro basins, which are equivalent to watersheds, but more of an international unit. And so um, you can turn those off and on as well. Another thing that you'll see that's very new and you know very exciting is we have this um, um, area called exchange services. And right now we just have one layer on here, but we think that the potential for this is huge. Um, this allows us to uh, see data from other um, exchange services. Oh, but I'm seeing that it's not actually turning on. <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a way to draw in information from other entities that are, um, you know, across, that are using the ArcGIS web map services, like the Nature Conservancy in the Adirondacks has this. And I'm sorry, actually, we'll have to come back to this later and see if it works later. When I was playing around with it yesterday, it was running just fine, but it will bring in information from other services that you can overlay on your map. So 
tune back in. <laughs> you know, this, as I'll, I'll note a couple times, this is always still a work in progress, and you know, things might go down for a little while and come back online um, as we, you know, fiddle under the, the programmers are fiddling under the hood to, to make everything come together. All right, and so a couple other things that I wanted to show you here um, are the um, different ways that you can identify data. So if I start zooming in, let's zoom into this area here in the cat skills. We have a lot of information. I only have the present species and the unconfirmed present species actually turned on, and I actually even have a filter on right now for the um, Hemlock Woolia Delta. But let's say I want to know what all these data points are. So I'm going to go ahead and use this Identify Measure tool, and it pops up this little box that says select the type of measurement you want to perform. So I'm going to select area, and now I'm going to draw a box around the area that I want to identify all the points in, and then double click to end that, and it calculates the area, which is handy, but what I'm really looking for is to see what's here. And so what's that, what that's going to do is bring up a table of all the different data types or in, um, that is under that area I just drew. You'll see first that there's a lot of tabs going across here that um, you know, have different types of data. So first we have that present species. So these are the confirmed species records that are um, under the shape that I drew. And I can click on the details for each of these. If I click on the, um, the different um, points, then they, they light up, they get um, that little blue box around them. I can also, under task, I can say flash the feature. And what that will do, you can see that one is turning red, it's kind of nice, it identifies it that way. If I click on the details, that's what will open up that detailed record page so that I can see all the information that that person entered. So if I let's click on this one for Hemlock Lilia Delgid, um, you can see the details, you can see the photos that the people entered and um, get more information that way. And then I want to go back to the map. Let's see here. And then if I go along these tabs across the top, I can look at the unconfirmed presence records. So there's only one of those. Um, probably, it probably doesn't have a photo in it, um, so we're not able to confirm it, but we still feel like it's valuable information to leave it there. Um, and it's also showing other record types that I didn't have turned on to my table of contents. So actually, you can use this little toggle that automatically comes on as include hidden layers. Like if I only wanted to see what I had turned on in my table of contents, so just the confirmed and unconfirmed, I can toggle off to, you know, not to include the hidden layers so I only see those two tables. If I do want to include the hidden layers, then it will also show me things like the approximate records that are underneath that, um, uh, that shape that I drew, the not detected species, treatments, and so forth. So there's a lot of information in there that you can get at. Um, then you can also, it also identifies, say, the county, um, if there were water bodies there um, under that, that area as well. So a lot of great information um, that you can get from those tables. So definitely use that identify measure tool. Uh, and another thing that is new and that we're very excited about is the export tool. And so this export tool actually exports what is in your screen view at that moment. So note that I have a filter on, and you can tell that I have a filter because that little filter icon is actually green, and if I click on it, then I can see what I'm filtered to, which is the Hemlock Willia Delgid. Um, so if I hit that export, it, and I can check the different data, data types, like whether it's a geodatabase or a CSV file. I do want the CSV that's more like a, um, an Excel, something that Excel will open up. Um, if I click that, it will um, scroll through. <laughs> I know it looks a little crazy right now because it has lots of different things that are, are running. Um, there are, unfortunately, the um, exports are divided up into the present species layers being either polygons, points, or lines. So you do have different downloads from those. So you'll have to e open up each of those files and get the data, and then you can um, aggregate those yourself. 
And so those will show up in the, um, the downloads section of my browser, my web browser. So one thing to keep in mind is that you can only download 10,000 records at a time. So that means, you know, if I'm zoomed way out and say if I had all species, you know, if I cleared my filter, um, I would not be able to export at this point. It's probably going to give me um, a, an error message saying too many records um, because I'm well over my 10,000 record um, limit. If you need custom data sets, you can still contact us like um, you always have through our website at, um, under the, the data request tab. There's a form you can fill out. Um, and right now, since we don't yet have the powerful query tools, I know it's hard to like arrange your, your screen exactly how you want to, to get that export. So um, if you can't get what you want using this export tool, then please contact us and we'll figure out a way to get it for you. All right. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm sorry, we have a, some chats are coming into the chat box, which we'll get to here in just a moment. So we'll um, get to those questions. One other thing I wanted to show you before we do open it up to questions, we've talked a lot about data, um, but I just wanted to show you another great thing that we have is that we have the species list um, exposed in IMAP3. And you'll see this terminology a lot, the jurisdiction versus network. Um, so jurisdiction is our state, and so anytime you see jurisdiction logged in as a New York user, um, that means that you're going to be seeing, say, the New York species list. Network means the whole network. So if I click on that, I'm going to see, say, 4,000 some species, because um, any of the states can um, draw on that. And this is drawing from the NatureServe list. NatureServe is the, the organization that created IMAP Invasives 3.0 and is running it, and um, they manage data um, across the, um, the hemisphere for rare species and significant communities and so forth, and so they have a lot of um, taxonomic expertise and have helped us um, create these species lists over the years. Um, but I want to say I wanted to go specifically to the New York species list. You can see that we have 485 species tracked in New York. Um, there are different filters that you can play around with. There's a species type filter, which will give you animal, plant, and microorganisms. Um, there is a habitat filter. We know there's a bug with that. Um, we will be working on that um, shortly. So. Oh, and actually right now I have two filters piled up on top of each other. We have more than two aquatic species in the state, so we'll be working on getting that habitat filter up and running before too long. Um, but then there are also things called confidential species, and there's a handful of species that um, a state agency has asked us to hide the, the information for. Um, because it's, you know, either they invoke quarantines or, you know, there's some type of legal ramification and, you know, we never want to get the data wrong, of course, and if somebody's entering something in for an Asian longhorn beetle but it's really a white spotted pine sawyer beetle, um, you know, if, if somebody sees that point and misinterprets it as a confirmed point, that could be a serious issue. So we want to make sure that um, the agencies who need to see that information can see it, but it's not readily available just yet. All right, so a lot of great information there. Um, of course, if I click on any of these species, I can get more detailed information about it. So the, um, you know, some of the information specifically from New York, and then if I, there's also the network level data. So if I click on that, that's where I can get the taxonomy information. Um, there's a link directly to the NatureServe Explorer page for each species, which is also very interesting information. Um, so, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good information you can get out of that. All right, so I'm going to go back to the map at this point, and I'm going to open it up for um, questions or other chats that we 